For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and culturally. Deep in the abyss of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other-than-human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistake. I invite you to go with me down the rabbit hole as I seek out the silenced, forgotten, buried, abandoned, and demonized stories and practices of regenerative, egalitarian, place-based cultures. There is still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationships to the land where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Hello, welcome to the Rewilding Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Michael Bauer. I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon, the traditional territory of the Multnomah and Clackamas Chinookan people, as well as the Kalapuya, Malala, Cowlitz, and many other tribal groups who have lived here, subsisted here, and traveled here to trade and make their living since time immemorial. This podcast is produced in partnership with Rewild Portland, a nonprofit organization, and is made possible through financial support from our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. If you feel inspired by this podcast, please subscribe, share it on social media, and write a review on Apple Podcasts. The best way to keep the podcast going is to become a patron at patreon.com slash petermichaelbauer. I recently had a patron ask me this question. What does your home life look like? How do you incorporate rewilding into day-to-day living? And I thought this would be a good chance to kind of talk a little bit about this. Um, Day-to-day rewilding. So, (laughs) as most of you, you know, maybe most listeners might know at this point, to me, rewilding is a lens. It's uh, a framework for going about your life, not a prescribed set of things that you do. So, um, it's really challenging for me to give, you know, top five ways you can rewild or 100 simple things you can do to rewild. Uh, Because anything that you do with the intent to rewild through that framework could be a stepping stone towards a further uh, or a deeper, more relationship, a deeper relationship to wildness, basically, right? So if we look at rewilding not as... um, Uh, as a binary of like, I am wild now, I was domesticated, now I am fully rewilded, Um, but rather uh, a constant inquiry into how to maintain and deepen your relationship to wildness. Um, There is no such thing as like a domestometer (laughs) to see how domesticated or wild someone is, right? Um, it's just how deeply are you entwined with wildness and how how much further are you wanting to take that journey so there is a spectrum essentially and I, I, as much as it's not really a binary there's still like you know being in a deep relationship with someone uh, or moving into a deep relationship with someone there's a sort of spectrum right you kind of move in and out of your relationship to other people throughout your life um, some people become just like inherent family members, right? Where you sit down and it's like you, there was never any time between you, even though it might've been 20 years or something, right? Like there's just this deep core connection. Um, and I think that the relationship to wildness is kind of like that, right? Especially in a, in a civilized world where, or a domesticated world where we're constantly being, uh, forced into elements of domestication, right? Like the state, uh, and you know, post-Neolithic sedentary agricultural villages um, all the way to the state have very specific uh, methodologies within the power structure to maintain their power. And a large part of that is indoctrination into domestication. So, you know, in Joseph Tainter's uh, Collapse of Complex Societies, it's called essentially legitimacy, right? So, we have to be trained from birth to believe in the process of domestication and accept it. So to embrace wildness, to rewild, to deepen our relationship to wildness is a 
huge challenge because it's, for one, illegal. Uh, the power structures don't want abandonment of their power structures of domestication. They don't want wild people, so they kill wild people, they kill wild culture, and they make it illegal. Or, uh, you know, a hobby, an expensive hobby, right? So you have uh, people who are call themselves, I'm a modern-day hunter-gatherer, for example, and what it really is is just a hobby for them. They're not a, a economic band of hunter-gatherers living from the land using ancestral regenerative technology. Um, they're buying machines produced by the industrial economy, paying for permits to the industrial state, um, and going and harvesting animals from a landscape that they are not fully integrated into. Um, so it's not the same thing at all. There's no such thing as a modern-day hunter-gatherer, except for hunter-gatherer societies that still exist today that are doing hunting and gathering. Um, that's not to say that you know hunting with technology and buying permits and all those things can't be considered a, an aspect of rewilding, but again, it has to do with your intent. Yes, if your intent is to um, learn these skills and develop them so that you can become integrated and have a deeper relationship to the land. Absolutely, those can be tools for doing that. Um, but it's uh, to me, there's sort of an identity grab or, or a desire to have this um, a mystique of the identity of a hunter-gatherer without actually having the relationship that hunter-gatherers have to their place or their cultural relationship to place. Um, so in terms of day-to-day -day living with rewilding, it's going to look different for everyone, um, whether you're in a rural place, um, you know, an uh, urban place, whether you're in uh, one country or another, depending on your, um, like the privileges bestowed upon you by the state government. If you're a billionaire, you can probably do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if you are a poor person in an urban environment that is a white supremacist state and you are not white, it might be challenging to do things that the state finds illegal, right? It's it's a lot easier for like a white person in upstate Maine, for example, to buy hunting permits, go out in the forest and do that um, than it is for, uh, let's say, the people of Standing Rock who are not white do not have a lot of money and are fighting for the, their their water right um which to me is more along the lines of rewilding than somebody who's doing hunting and gathering as a hobby that's not to say that there aren't all these threads and that we're not all sort of trying to get there together in different ways or that you have to be um you know a water protector to be a rewilder or something along those lines that's not what i'm saying but i'm saying there's like a deep context for every individual and how that relates to their own rewilding path or their cultural rewilding path, right? Because there's individuals, um, and then there's your, your collective. And to me, rewilding is not something that you do as an individual per, per se. Um, obviously, we, we live as individuals. And again, in, in this particular country, in the United States, much of what I'm talking about is going to be based on, on that history um, and those demographics, because that's where I'm coming from. Um, rewilding is going to look different, very different in different places all over the world. So uh, again, once I start talking about what rewilding looks like to me, it's still going to be a limited framework on my own imagination based on um, the constraints of that imagination, based on where I'm at, right? There are certain things that um, I would just never even find imaginable because I have no concept of what they might be. Um, so uh, in terms of rewilding, you have to think about what does rewilding together look like? Yes, I'm doing rewilding on an individual basis. So people want to know what my day-to-day -day practices are. Okay, so let's, I'm going to break this down the way I break it down in my classes, um, which is uh, personal rewilding, collective rewilding, institutional rewilding. You can just kind of throw that. Institutional rewilding is just like essentially a state level of power uh, of a collective, right? It's like the when you have the the state influence, right? You can leverage that power structure against itself. So when I think of institutions, I think of, you know, Rewild Portland, for example, is an institution, um, not a collective, because it's, uh, to me, a collective isn't something that's necessarily on paper. It's not something that uh, interacts with the state in, per se, uh, whereas an institution is like a registered business, for example, um, or, a red, or a part of the government or that kind of thing, whereas a collective could just be a group of friends like a uh, you know a, a neighborhood f 
food buying co-op or something that maybe that's not, you know, maybe they're just a bunch of people who come together and buy food collectively to make it more affordable. Right. Um, <clears throat> that to me is more of just a collective, even if it's like a minor thing on paper, it's not necessarily um, something that's being taxed. Right. I think of institutions as like, even if it's a nonprofit, it's like in the tax regime in some way or another, even if it's classified as a nonprofit and you don't pay taxes, you're still having to be classed within that structure. Um, a bureaucratic structure, I guess. So on an individual basis, um, you know, uh, I, <laughs> let me first just say uh, that to me, I'm a social animal and I think most humans are. I think that's just how we've evolved. So if I walk into a room and everybody's watching a television, uh, I'm going to watch the television it's going to be really hard for me to have the sort of what we would consider individual willpower, wild power, um, to resist the cultural will because we are we evolved as social organisms, part of cultural grander wills than our individual will. And so when we think about wildness or willedness, collective willedness is more powerful. So the idea of having willpower um, is really a hard thing to impose on people to reject the system of domestication when the whole culture is willing us, you know, with the power of institutions to remain domesticated. Um, on top of that, you have uh, socially or, or not socially, but individually evolved uh, like brain chemistry. So our wills in terms of our willpower are also very much dictated on our evolutionary history. So, you know, if we think about like dopamine and the response to dopamine that our brains have, um, it makes it really challenging to think about things like drug addiction, which, uh, you know, certain drugs weren't available in our evolutionary history. And so the dopamine response to those is absurd because it's something that we never experienced. Um, but our brains are not designed, but adapted to seek out that same kind of dopamine response. So again, willpower, our wildness is in part our evolutionary adaptation in terms of our biology. So we are adapted to seek out these dopamine responses like drugs, um, but they didn't exist prior to cultures of domestication. And so we are actually adapted to Overconsume certain things like sugar, for example, you know, calor calorically dense foods. Our brains are like, yes, keep doing this, keep doing this, keep doing this. Um, and so that that is in an in a sense that is our innate will, because it's an evolved um, aspect of ourselves that we have to then fight because the cultural will has created this other thing, and so it becomes really complex when you start getting down into like, what is willpower? What is free will? Um, and if we think about like that, we do have will, free will, individual will, but it is constrained within all kinds of things, including our biology, deeply embedded in our biology to, um, you know, follow what the group is doing, to consume things that are high in calories. Like all of these things are, are part of our biology. And so um, it makes it really challenging when the culture at large is a destructive culture because we are then, our, our wildness is to become part of that culture that is you know destructive so in terms of of rewilding as an individual it becomes much more complex um and harder to be to be frank it becomes really challenging to just do rewilding stuff because of this concept of of free will and then if we cannot follow through with the free will especially in in the united states where we have american individualism it becomes really, really hard. Uh, you know, we judge ourselves basically, right? Um, I can't do this. Um, you know, it's something's wrong with me. It's my fault, but it's not. Our biology is adapted to do these certain things. So if we can embrace that idea that our biology is adapted to certain things and that the environment is the, going to be the thing that produces the results of our day to day lives, then what we do have the power to do is transform our environments and remove the things in our environments, the bad cues to do things that we don't want to do that are connected to domestication. 
Um, and that's a challenging thing because a lot of those things, you know, are, again, we, we've evolved to have these dopamine responses. Our brains crave that. Uh, and so, it, and it's part, in a, if you look at that as our adapted biology, the dopamine response is a part of our wildness, our wildness. And so we have to fight an element of our wildness because the culture has created a destructive force that plays off of our wildness, right? Um, and I think about, you know, social media is a great example where they've, they've designed the programs to give people dopamine responses. You, you log in and you see the little red bubble that indicates you have a new message or another like or these different things, and it's shown we get a dopamine response. So they're creating um, an addictive platform to keep us there. Uh, and it's really hard to exit that when all your friends are interacting there, right? So not only is it a thing where our individually we're experiencing a dopamine hit every time we log into social media, um, but all of our friends are interacting and not all of you know, I'm, again, I'm, this is generally speaking for, for my demographic, right? Um, and this is just one example of how this plays out all over. But, you know, most of my friends and, and community members are on social media. So if I wanted to interact with them, I have to be using these platforms, right? Or at least that's what I'm telling myself and the more I do that. But then if I think, oh, I'll just delete this app and I'll just, I'll really make an effort to like call people again. And I'm not even going to text them. I'm going to like call them on the phone, which is something that I do from time to time. And it just, it inevitably doesn't really work. And so we're fighting this cultural wave of domestication. Um, and I have to preface that with any kind of day-to-day -day thing, right? Because we have to acknowledge that we're all captives of civilization. I don't know a single um, person personally that is not a captive of civilization, that somehow lives outside of the civilizational system that isn't like uh, integrated into domestication, right? I don't know anybody. And even then, there, the more wildness we can embrace, there's still a, uh, we still have to interface with civilization. Um, and so how do you, you know, how do you reconcile all of those things, right? Um, it makes this really complex and complicated. And so when I talk about my day-to-day -day aspects of rewilding, I really have to think about um, all of the different elements that are uh, maintaining the culture of captivity that I'm fighting against. So I think about cultural mentoring. You know, it's, like I said earlier, if I walk into a room, everyone's looking at the television, I'm going to sit down and start watching the TV too, right? So what can I do? And this is why I started Rewild Portland, really. What can I do if I know that about myself to create a community where our values are different, where our environments are different? We don't have a, a TV in the center stage of the room. You know, I watch television. Um, but I don't have it as a, like a priority in my community. Um, I engage with media. I don't social media, video games, movies, these kinds of things, because that's part of being in this culture. <laughs> um, I don't reject wholeheartedly everything. I don't think that's a sustainable way of doing something. Um, there's a level of integration and transformation that I follow. So, like, on a personal level, and I discussed some of this in the Depression in Rewilding um, podcast with Sheila Henson, you know, um, for me, individual rewilding has mainly to do with my health. And if I'm not paying attention to my health, I get depressed. And that's because of the system of domestication that exists that then creates these kinds of things like depression um, because we have limited movement, right? Uh, because we are eating foods that while are on the one level, our brain is like, yes, this is full of calories, do this more, isn't giving us the nutrition that we need. Um, you know, in a capitalist framework where, especially again, American individualism, where there's this work ethic projected onto us that if we're not constantly working, we're, we're worthless. Um, you know, oftentimes we don't sleep very much or because we worked all day, we want to engage in socialization outside of that. We stay up later than we should. Or because we worked all day and we're depressed, we're going to consume drugs um, to help you know, self-medicate the problems that we're experiencing emotionally, socially, physically, all of those things. Um, and so to me, you know, uh, as an individual, it's really hard for me to do things. So I created Rewild Portland to stand as a cultural um, values 
community for us to continue to to work together, connect around these skills outside of some of these platforms. Um, as an individual, that makes me a, a cultural organizer, right? That's kind of my role is generating community. Um, I'm not particularly good at any one thing. I mean, you know, I like basket weaving. I like bone tools. There's a few things I have some ex specialty knowledge in, but really what I do is community organizing. So that's my like, again, and it's hard for me to sort of think of myself as an individual because I like to do things in groups. It's really hard for me to like sit down and weave by myself, for example. Um, but if there's like a weaving group, if we're going to do a thing together, a craft night, et cetera, then I'm on board. I'm a social organism. I need that sociality. Whereas, you know, other people that I know are much more reclusive. They don't necessarily need that. I do. <laughs> um, so to me, day-to-day -day rewilding is really planning, you know, as a, as my, for my job with Rewild Portland, day-to-day uh, -day I'm community organizing. That's what I do. Um, on a Outside of the organization of Rewild Portland, which is hard to sort of suss sometimes the difference between my work life, my personal life, because they all overlap. A lot of my friends are the people that work with Rewild Portland. Um, I have friends that don't work with Rewild Portland. I have a life outside of that, but it's sort of just blended together, um, not necessarily seamlessly, but they overlap so much. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Um, but so there's the, the social organizing part of what I do, and then there's the sort of like individual rewilding or the outside of the the institution of rewild portland where i work the collective which would be like me and my partner and maybe our household and the kinds of things that we do around the house like growing food in our backyard um you know i really think that uh the the core element of any culture is food and growing food or harvesting food and understanding the regenerative relationship to food so not just extraction like the way we often think of as gathering but actually gardening, but but like passive gardening, the way we think of foraging or gathering. So this sort of like in between where we're not just extracting plants that we know are edible and consuming them, we're thinking about how to give back, right? We're, we're taking things out of the environment with the knowledge of giving back. How do we harvest something in a way that it will come back the next year? Um, and, you know, how do we harvest a thing in a way that will keep it indefinitely? Regenerative relationships. Um, and so how can I do that in my little postage stamp sized backyard, you know, um, and I garden at home uh, during the, the main season. I'm still learning how to do um, like winter gardening. I took the master gardener class, which was a through the Oregon State University Extension, which was cool. I learned a lot about just kind of like your classic farming gardening um, strategies, which was interesting to kind of layer on top of what I already have uh, in terms of my knowledge of foraging and wild plants. And kind of see a, a way of combining those two things into more of like a horticultural transition society as opposed to returning fully to some hunter-gatherer existence, which, um, you know, again, in like day-to-day -day concept of rewilding, I don't see returning to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle as a viable option uh, because the megafauna that people survived on as hunter-gatherers for or lived with and lived on, lived in relation to for hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, don't exist anymore. There aren't really giant megafauna that humans could subsist off of um, in a regenerative, sustainable way, at least not at the scale that we're at. So when we think about downscaling or transition culture, um, rewilding as a spectrum, then what I'm looking at is how can I trans start to transition where I'm at and move it into something else? So I look at my backyard and I think, what can I grow here? What are my, what are my, there's like three elements, right? What are my favorite foods that I like um, that are maybe just farmed food? So my favorite food is butternut squash. So I grow lots of butternut squash. That's like the non-native sort of classic garden vegetable that I like to grow. Um, I also grow kale and chard. Um, but then I also grow wild foods uh, like that are non-native, like um, salsify. I have a whole salsify patch in my yard. I have a Jerusalem artichoke patch in my yard. Even though Jerusalem artichokes from North America, they're not from the Northwest. Um, and then I also have sort of, you know, a, a classic horticultural plants like blueberries. Uh, but then I have native plants that I'm growing and cultivating too, like uh, stinging nettle, thimbleberry, uh, salmonberry, Oregon white oak, little little baby Oregon white oaks I found. Um, and then I'm also, you know, always looking at the invasive species that are in my yard that were here 
and trying to learn what they are. What is this plant? And the cool, two cool ones that I found was one when I was in the Master Gardener course, um, they were like, this is an invasive species called Lesser Celandine. It's the bane of Portland. And I raised my hand. And I said, can, does anybody know if it's edible or you can do anything, you know, medicinal or anything? And they were like, no, it's just a terrible weed. You have to spray it and kill it and get rid of it. And I just like opened my laptop in class and Googled like Lesser Celandine, edible. And of course it's an edible. Um, you just have to, it's also called piles because the little root bulbs, they look kind of like hemorrhoids, like swollen <laughs> hemorrhoids. Um, and so, but you can get those little rootlets out and roast them in a fire and cook them and then just pop them in your mouth. And it's like potatoes. I haven't tried it yet because I'm waiting for them to to come in. That's going to be the next thing that I do. I'll probably make a little video about it for TikTok or something. Um, but it's just exciting to kind of understand like what are the foods that are growing right here that I don't have to tend at all that are just you know vigorous like invasive species that happen to also be foods and then by eating them I'm managing their populations I'm becoming the predator that they didn't have here to minimize their population. Um, what are the plants that I really like that I can grow here? So butternut squash. What are the native plants that I like that that I can restore here? Stinging nettle, thimbleberry. Um, and so to me, yeah, rewilding is on a day-to-day -day personal level there's the health aspect of it there's a collective aspect of it of like gardening and growing food to give away i mean that's the other part of this too is uh i you know i want to grow enough food that i'm giving a little bit of way to my friends i don't need to rely on the food in my backyard um and so i'm growing it mostly for the knowledge of how to grow it so i'm integrating on a daily basis my relationship to place in multiple facets from native species to non-native species to invasive species to classic garden vegetables um i'm i'm growing my relationship with all of those things while at the same time being able to pass off some of that food and that knowledge onto others um and that's just like a little microcosm right so it's not like i'm living as a undomesticated free creature, right? I'm still paying a water bill to water these plants. I live in a house. Um, you know, uh, I, I buy food from the grocery store, right? But then I also go foraging outside of the city in particular places that I've come to tend. Um, and for me, it's a, and then also, you know, again, in the institutional level with Rewild Portland, we're, we bought, we've got a nursery, we've got a greenhouse, we're growing food, we're growing medicine, we're growing um, fiber plants. So just trying to sort of like create these little um, seed pockets to then sprout and grow and share these things around a community because, and this is sort of a, a deeper part of all of this is that on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm constantly thinking about the collapse of civilization and, and just that rewilding is a fun thing you can do that deepens your relationship to place and also is helping people or will help people transition through collapse so even if i die and i you know i <laughs> don't survive the next pandemic or whatever um the impact that i've had on my life has been to create as much more life and resilience as possible within that framework so if i died tomorrow i'd be pretty happy that um i i made this little impact you know i planted some trees that are going to grow food for future generations that's that's pretty much what I feel the purpose of my life is, is to pass a torch of resilience onto the next generation. And so day to day, I don't wake up and go, how can I do that? I'm just kind of doing the things already that I know. I'm always tweaking and coming up with more ideas. Um, you know, also reskilling, right? Not just knowing the skills of, of um, growing food, but also weaving baskets and doing these kinds of things. And um, I'll I'll get in, gain a certain level of fluency in something like baskets, and then I'll kind of put it on the back burner and go and do some other follow some other rabbit hole, and then I read some books on you know different elements to think about with collapse, or I'll I'll try different skills or network with different people. So I think on the day to day basis, again, this is just sort of my my own practice, but I think in terms of like there is no such thing as a rewilding lifestyle. There is a rewilding framework. And you get to create your rewilding lifestyle based on that framework, you know. Um, and it's basically just a set of principles of trying to live in regenerative reciprocity with the land and people. Um, and that means it's you know fiercely egalitarian, fiercely about regenerative practices within the landscape, and being aware of the collapse of civilization, or just that society's 
that are over consuming are going to reach a point of diminishing returns. So being aware of those things and making your decisions based on that idea. Um, I don't know really what else there is to say beyond, beyond that. So I think I'm going to, um, I'm just trying to think of like day to day stuff, you know, uh, every day is different. Every day is different. And, um, it's just sort of like little drops in the bucket for whatever. I, I also have this concept of like trying not to think about um, delayed return so much. Like have enough immediate return gratification things that all the that you you enjoy every day, regardless of whether or not you ever hit some outcome. Like you know, I think part of the one of the psychological challenges with rewilding is once you understand your once you see the bars of the cage of civilization of domestication. There's this deep desire to be outside of that. And, and really for me, you know, I did a, I don't tell a lot of people this, but I'm going to tell everybody now. When I was 21, I did a, a vision quest with this organization called, well, I'm not going to say their name because I don't like them, but um, I did a vision quest with an organization I, I don't particularly like. But in the experience, I realized I needed to embrace and accept that I was never really going to live the sort of idealistic lifestyle that I had dreamt up and read about. And that instead I was going to have to create something that was as much as I possibly could create within my own constraints. Um, and so while rewilding, you know, rewilding is about escaping captivity, not making captivity more comfortable. So how can I, what can I do in my lifetime to dig a little bit deeper under the wall? to pry the bars of the cage a little bit wider so that the next group that comes up has a better chance of pulling it open even further, right? If I can't get out fully, what can I do that's just on a day-to-day -day basis on my daily routines that makes me feel like I'm doing something, that I'm accomplishing something? And I'll accept the fact that I'll never actually live some idealized life. Because if you're, and, and we talked about this a little bit in the, um, an interview with um, Leonard Martin on um, you know the search of in meaning of hunting and gathering. If you're living for something that's in the future, then you're basically living in constant anxiety. And so one of the challenges with understanding collapse is that we're we're kind of waiting for it to happen, but it's happening all the time. It's just it's not something that happens overnight per se. There are absolutely collapses that happen overnight. There are there are swift declines. And there are slow declines and moments of both within the full decline of civilization. But if we're constantly like waiting, well, we'll someday we'll do the thing that we love to do because civilization will be collapsed and then we'll be able to do this thing. Um, instead of living for that thing that we'll never see, we just need to live in the moment for ourselves and accept where we are on a level so that we can actually do the work. Because sometimes too, thinking about it, um, if you think about, you have a goal that's, unattainable if you're never going to attain that goal then you're always just going to kind of feel like shit <laughs> and i know this from experience because that's basically one of the the more psychological challenges that i've had in my life is like waiting for this time or expecting this thing that's never going to come fully the way that i thought and then i'm pleasantly surprised when things do come along that i've been waiting a long time to see happen but another thing I think about too, in terms of like personal anxiety, is this quote. I think it was like, I don't remember. I don't remember who said this. Maybe it was like Stephen King or somebody like that. But the quote is that um, suspense isn't not knowing what's going to happen, suspense is knowing what's going to happen, but not knowing when. And I think about that a lot with collapse and with anxiety and depression and these things that are involved in rewilding is it like you're watching a movie you know and you know the killer's out there and they're behind the the person or whatever you know what you know that they're going to get attacked but you don't know when right um and that is suspense but you could also translate to anxiety right uh, or ignorance is bliss you know that's another one of those expressions where if someone doesn't understand that the collapse of civilization is coming they're not going to even be thinking about it but as soon as you recognize that all societies reach a point of diminishing returns that are over consuming their resources and then collapse, and you can see the signs of ours doing that, it becomes a thing of 
knowing it's going to happen, but not knowing when, and then having anxiety over it. So to me, um, again, there's this element of like just embracing that it's just going to fucking happen. You don't know when it's going to happen. Just forget about that and just do the things that are rewilding because those are the things that are going to be number one, fun. I mean, it's fun to garden. You you like go on to PubMed or whatever and do a search on like mental health and gardening and you'll see like thousands of studies or whatever, maybe not thousands, dozens, hundreds, I don't know, of studies that talk about how um, gardening is just like a classic thing that makes people happy. (laughs) I mean, if you think about it, it's physical work in the land. Um, It's a deep connection. You're getting that uh, those results right away. You're you're getting the probably like a, a empathetic connection with the living things that you tend. Um, so there's this interesting thing there of just like day to day practice of embracing where we're at and doing the things that are fun in rewilding as a way of carrying a torch. And I think this changes the psychology too of. What I mean when I I say that rewilding is not a thing to do to survive the collapse of civilization. That's what preppers are doing. Prepping is, you know, trying to survive the collapse of civilization. Rewilding is just making the world more wild. Rewild is just making the world more alive. And that also helps with the idea of collapse. But that's not the intent behind rewilding. The intent behind rewilding shouldn't be that you want to survive the collapse of civilization. That should be a side, a a bonus. Rewilding is about creating more life in the world and feeling more resilient in your body and in your place and in your community, with your community, with your collective. So however you can do that on a day-to-day basis, you know, um, that's, that's the day-to-day rewilding. Now, there was a second question that I was asked that, that I saw related to this. So I wanted to um, answer that one too. <laughs> okay, prompt. Fast forward a few decades. What does Peter Michael Bauer, the elder, do, think, feel, share with the world? How can rewilding aspirants plan to thrive, share, and make a difference over their lifespan, despite persistent economic uncertainty and worsening climate upheavals? So, um, <laughs> what do I, what does Peter Michael Bauer, the elder, th- do think feel share with the world um i mean that's just such a complex we don't know what's going to happen so how you can't really plan for any particular thing but what you can do is plan to become as adaptive as possible and being adaptive means knowing your place you know if you know your place you can find clean water you can boil it you know where your firewood can come from you know what foods are edible native invasive and gardened foods right Um, so there's a level of just like understanding that rewilding is about like in order to create more wildness, we need to become more adaptable. So, and again, all these things are fun. Like learning to do these things just makes you feel good. Gardening makes you feel good. Foraging makes you feel good. Hiking is, you know, all all the things that you, and you can hike through your neighborhood. I do this every day. I hike through the neighborhood. It's not, you know, people call it going for a walk when you walk around an urban area and they call it a hike when you walk around the forest. But to me, it's all the same. It's all hiking. So when I'm walking in the urban environment, I'm looking at my neighbor's yards and looking at what's growing in there. Is it edible? Is it medicinal? Um, I go to the park. I walk around the park. Where is it being sprayed by the park? I can tell that what's being killed. What are they spraying? Uh, I can read the signs and talk and, you know, try to figure out what I could eat there that isn't sprayed or um, just all the different things. I learn my landscape. I learn where water is coming from. I learn where I could go and get firewood. I learn these different things that um, may or may not be applicable even in whatever world we see. You know, if we're looking at um, the collapse of complex societies, migration might be a huge part of that and, and inevitably will. You know, there's all there's refugees all over the world, right? And different as as power vacuums come and get filled and go and all those things, people tend to move around a lot. So again, I think this is where being mobile, hyper mobile would help. Um, not accumulating a lot of things or thinking that you're going to be in one place, but learning all about plants i mean really you can go across the continent and there are similar plants that grow everywhere you know there's oak trees grow everywhere pretty much you know so if you know how to process oaks there are certain plants that you could do that are 
in mo multiple ecosystems. So you can learn those things. Um, psychologically, I think there's a there's a um, being adaptable psychologically is probably like the number one thing, right? So being able to just say I give up on a place rather than try to stay in a certain frame of mind, being fluid in your state of mind, being able to say, okay, let's go, let's move, you know, rather than being stuck in a particular place. And I think for me, that's just always something that's, <laughs> that's come pretty easy to me. I don't know why. And I think I'm, you know, but I like, for example, when I dropped out of high school, it didn't take much to be fully honest, even though my entire life i had been told that you had to graduate high school to go to college and you had to go to college to get a good job um taking that risk right um saved my life and so i think about this a lot with um certain mythological frameworks you know when you drop out of high school people say things like oh you're just going to flip burgers for the rest of your life which is uh, super classist anyway, right? Um, but also just simply not, not true. It's a way of scaring people into um, paying for college and getting into debt and these different things. Like the, the, the whole system that is set up to tell people what the right way of living is, is totally messed up. And so psychologically, being able to um, break away from what you've been told is the way that you're supposed to do something and be willing and open to do something different is, I think, the number one like survival skill in a in a abrupt collapse or even just in life. Really, um, being able to be adaptable, both in body, mind, conscious <laughs> consciousness, whatever, um, and with the, with your collective of people and having a collective that's adaptable too. Being willing to see where your moment, momentum was going, recognize it's a failure and let it transform into something else, you know? Um, and I say this a lot too, even with something like Rewild Portland, which, you know, nothing lives forever. Nothing lasts forever. And the idea that something should is a civilized, domesticated way of thinking. I don't think that Rewild Portland, Rewild Portland should last forever and someday it, it will dissolve and the resources that it accumulated will dissolve into the community. You know, I'm hoping that doesn't happen for a long time because I see it as a great resource in the meantime. Um, but everything is going to change. And if you hold on to that way of life, if you hold on to the thing and you don't accept change, that is a, a kind of a form of fragility that will shatter, right? And that is what prevents people from being fluid and adaptable is clinging to the thing that needs to be let go of so being willing to let go of the previous life you know on a day-to-day -day basis i actually have like a mantra that i say to myself um which is a kind of accumulation of uh different teachers of mine two in particular martin prechtel and benicia madrano you know i say to myself plant back for a time beyond our own because you're already dead. Um, and this is something that I say to myself pretty regularly. Plant back comes from Phoenicia, which is to restore areas and create a regenerative way of life. Um, for a time beyond your own is some Martin Prechtel lingo that is like a, almost a selfless act of thinking about, you know, being a good ancestor. So you're planting back, you're doing the restoration work for a time beyond your own. Um, and then because I'm already dead is a sort of recognition that life is short <laughs> and, um, being willing to let go when the time comes and that I'm going to do everything I can and have that willingness to let go, uh, because I'm already gone, right? I've already, in a sense, if, if we look at, you know, time is an illusion, then I'm already dead. We're all already dead. Everything is past. So also don't take things super seriously within this moment. Just plant back for a time beyond your own. That's the core thing um, to do in life. Um, <laughs> I don't know. This is, I'll get, this is sort of a, an eclectic mix of my day, concepts of my day-to-day -day rewilding. But when I think about you know myself as an elder and what I feel and share with the world, I imagine that it will be the same things I'm doing now. I'll have a deeper and um, 
and a longer lens for all of these things. And I'll be continuing to share them uh, with the world because that's just who I am. And I'll probably be continuing to organize until I die, whenever that is. Um, so how can rewilding aspirants plan to thrive, share, and make a difference over their lifespan? I mean, I think I, despite persistent economic uncertainty and worsening climate upheavals, in terms of economic uncertainty, I think there's a lot of, um, again, being willing to let go of everything. So what happens if you end up houseless, for example, um, you know, in the same way of like dropping out of high school, dropping out of um, the housing <laughs> complex, um, you might feel shame, uh, but that's a mythological framework. You've been shamed into um, paying a landlord or paying a mortgage for your existence, even shamed for existing. So being able to let go of those mytholo that, that mythology and welcome being houseless um, and then figuring out how to reframe those, that way of life so that you have safety and security and comfort within the level that you can, right? And again, that comes down to like collective living. There's lots of um, houseless village sites all around Portland, and there's more that are being built. And these are folks that uh, oftentimes become houseless due to like mental health crisis more so than economic. Um, but the, the relationship there is kind of similar. And as collapse intensifies, more and more people are going to be houseless. There's just no fucking way for the economy to work with everybody, you know, for the, people can barely pay rent or a mortgage. And so it's just an inevitability, right? So the economic uncertainty, um, it comes down to, again, this sort of collective power. So most of the you know, um, mutual aid networks, our anarchist mutual aid networks are getting food and not housing necessarily, but some housing, but getting um, tents and supplies and things so that people have shelter and the things that they need and that they can maintain their comfort within that. And I just see that as rewilding. Kinship building, um, you know, is a whole other aspect of that. Kinship building. Um, and breaking away from those those mythological things. So even in terms of economics, you know, people um, are going to get a lot more used to living without as without as much consumption and excess. I think what people think of as um, you know uh, economic uncertainty in the United States, oftentimes for like middle class people, is like you know having to not have their power on. Like if we had mandatory blackouts or even like rolling blackouts that's going to be like people are having their toys taken away but it's that's all excess anyway so how you know in terms of rewilding values and the economy i think a lot about how we can actually live with a lot less than what we are taught we need to have um and everybody's going to have a different perception of that so um but really you know what is the relationship to economics and overconsumption. What are we overconsuming that we don't really need? And how can we get our basic and you know our necessary needs met collectively? So um I hope that that answers that question as well. Um in terms of last thoughts around day-to-day -day rewilding, I mean I would say everybody can figure that out for yourself. So, you know, what are the things that you enjoy in, in rewilding, adjacent to rewilding? Do you enjoy community organizing? Do you enjoy ancestral skills? Do you enjoy um, gardening? You know, all of these different things. What are the things that you're good at? What are the things that you enjoy? What are your economic um, standings? How can you diminish excess things you don't need, but create a community around the things that you do need so that you're not spending, um, you know, funds? and time doing things you don't need to do. Um, and, and you figure that out for yourself. There's no way to know what anyone's day-to-day -day rewilding is except for you. You're going to create your own version of me blabbing here today. Um, I just think that in order for it to be rewilding, you have to be thinking about that it's escaping the, the, the context of civilization and not making domestication more comfortable, but returning to a resilient way of life. Um, and if you're doing those things in that context of what rewilding is, then it's rewilding. 
and there is no such thing as a rewilding lifestyle. And yours might look completely different than what I do, um, depending on where you are in the world, what your demographics are, etc. Completely different. Um, but they intersect. And so it's cool to figure out where different day-to-day -day rewilding <laughs> intersects. And that's where the community and collective aspect becomes so much more powerful. Because it's important that all of our day-to-day -day rewilding are unique and different to ourselves because then when we come together, we create a diversity of rewilding and what that looks like. And we're able to um, be more adaptive that way. If everybody was doing the same thing, that's just not adaptive. So we want to have you know, a diverse form or, or we want rewilding to, be, to maintain its diversity and to look different, and to know that people in the heart of New York City, Manhattan, could be rewilding, um, as well as people in the middle of fucking nowhere, you know, in the woods. And where's the, where's the thread that interfaces those people together? Um, that's what I'm most curious about in terms of understanding everyone's day-to-day -day rewilding. So it's kind of on my, on my um, back burner to start another podcast at some point, or maybe just incorporated in this one, where I actually interview people doing rewilding and their day-to-day -day rewilding. So I'm going to actually start that. Um, I'm going to start that up next, uh, th this coming summer. And I'll be interviewing people. And, and again, just to get a diverse voice of what rewilding looks like or what it can look like in multiple settings so that we have a better uh, scope we understand what it looks like because if you read about it in the paper they're gonna just take the most extreme version of like somebody like Phoenicia, you know living out in the forest in buckskins and they're gonna like this is what rewilding is and then everybody reads that and they're like oh that's impossible just like how you know in the paper permaculture you know i think in my book rewild or die in my permaculture chapter i quoted the willamette week paper here in portland that was like permaculture just basically means letting your yard get really messy and that's like if I were a permaculturalist and I read that, I would just like shit my pants I, with, <laughs> with frustration. <laughs> I, I, I'm not like a huge proponent of permaculture, but I know what it is. I have my design certificate. I work with permaculturalists. I like it as a, an extra tool to add to my rewilding tool uh, kit. You know, um, it's a design science. There's so much that goes into the way you think with permaculture that for somebody to just say, oh, it's basically just letting your yard get really messy. I mean, that's what people say about rewilding too. So kind of interesting there. Um, and those things really frustrate me, frustrate me uh, because it, it just destroys the momentum, the collective momentum for new people to come in and understand what it really means. If somebody is to say that, oh, this is the rewilding lifestyle and I'm a modern day hunter gatherer, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me because it's somebody who clearly just has no concept of the breadth of what rewilding looks like and they don't understand collapse and they don't understand the diversity of um, subsistence strategies or collective anarchism and kinship building and all just the just the depth of what it means to be human essentially and what wildness is um, to just pigeonhole it into this little thing so i'm really curious for everybody out there uh you know what is your rewilding day-to-day -day, uh lifestyle what and, and how do you incorporate all these different things Think about that and how different everybody else's is. And that's where I'll, I guess I'll just go ahead and leave it at that. Um, if you enjoyed this, you know, uh, again, this was answering some questions on my Patreon. So patreon.com slash Peter Michael Bauer. Uh, I do a podcast every once in a while that answers some questions. If you're a patron, you can ask them to me and I'll get around to having a podcast about it. And this one, yeah, day-to-day -day rewilding. So yeah, please uh, support the podcast if you can, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks.